in San Francisco. It's the Cube covering Apache Sparkmaker community event brought to you by IBM. Now, here are your hosts, John Walls and George Gilbert. And welcome back inside the Galvanized campus here in San Francisco as the Cube continues our coverage of the Apache Sparkmaker community event sponsored by IBM. The general session is tonight. You'll be able to see that live here, by the way. We'll be streaming that keynote session and also uh, be bringing you interviews from throughout the week at the Spark Summit, which is tomorrow and Wednesday as well at the Hilton, just across town. Uh, but today we're in Galvanize, a uh, really neat space, and George Gilbert is sharing it with me today. Uh, George, it's been a pleasure to have you riding shotgun here. And we are joined by John Akron, who's the CTO of the Silicon Valley Data Science Group. And uh, John, we appreciate the time here. Thanks for being with us. Great to be here. Tell us about, uh, first off, what you all do. Uh, I, I realize uh, as a consultant, you have a pretty wide portfolio, but you have some areas of core expertise to know. You're happy to share with your client base. Absolutely, absolutely. So we are uh, maybe starting a trend in naming Silicon v companies after what they do. So we uh, bring a Silicon Valley approach to doing data science for our customers. And uh, what that means is we're uh, about a 70-person consulting company these days, uh, growing fast as a, as a good Valley company does. Uh, and, and we work with companies about four basic ways. Um, we help them answer their strategic question of what should they do with data. So most companies have a business agenda. They want better, deeper relationships with their customers. They want uh, a more optimized and resilient supply chain. They want more optimized and resilient manufacturing, et cetera. Uh, and, and so for us, data strategy is, OK, so what investments in technology, capability, people, and process do you need to make to unlock that business opportunity with these kinds of data cut? technologies and capabilities. So once they've made those kinds of decisions, and not every, you know, lots of folks have that already uh, in hand, we work in architecture advisory to answer the question of, okay, well, if that's what you want to do, and that means we need to build a recommender system, does that mean, you know, I need a Hadoop uh, system with this or that or the other thing? So what architecture and what uh, specific technologies will build that thing that unlocks that business advantage? And we call that architecture advisory. Mm -hmm. And then mostly what we do with customers is help them build those things out. So we have teams of engineers, data scientists, architects, designers, uh, and project managers that come from a range of Silicon Valley companies, consulting companies, and uh, places like that. And we work very closely with clients to then go build those capabilities with them. So let's go back to the first piece, data strategy. Um, how has that evolved over the past uh, even 12, 18 months uh, <clears throat> with, with Spark catching spark, if you will, with, mm -hmm. with really kind of lighting up uh, the landscape in that regard. I mean, how, how has it changed from what you're telling people, uh, the, where they should be going, and how they're going to get there? Sure. So um, there's a couple of axes on which the, the questions become really interesting. One is, you know, there's these new technologies, things like Spark and the machine learning libraries that we can put on top of Spark and the ways that we can feed data uh, to Spark in a streaming manner through something like Kafka to get a streaming capability in place. And all of those kinds of innovations open up newly addressable areas for data technology to serve the business. Uh, so a, often the focus of a data strategy for us is, okay, we're working with a customer. What does that mean? Um, a good example of this was some work we did with Edmunds.com where the core question was, uh, has NLP technology developed fast enough that we can take these unstructured uh, views of what a car is that come in the form of a PDF that BMW sends you to describe what a 4 Series is, and can we can we use NLP technology to recognize that BMW's xDrive is the same as Mercedes' 4Matic, is the same as Audi's Quattro, is the same as Ford's four-wheel drive, et cetera. So does NLP open up a new way of doing this that then brings some fundamental new value to the business, and those questions are what we're answering answering in a typical data strategy. Um, the other dimension is to what purpose are we, or, 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 or what is the scope of a data strategy and is it truly strategic? Um, more and more, we're seeing businesses really interested in opening up strategic new top line capabilities with data, mm -hmm. yet a lot of what folks call data strategy is really a series of 
tactics around controlling access, cleaning, securing. You know, when you it's go more to like a, protocols and procedures, and, exactly. and not exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> when you yeah. go to a when you go to a typical data data management conference and talk about data strategy, it it, it really focuses in on those tax, tactics and and. There's a, a, a new view emerging, and, and we're both trying to catalyze and participate in that view, that um, the focus should really be first on what are you trying to do, and then those tactics become very, very important. But the strategy is, you know, what investments do I make in capability now? And um, there, we have an enlightened self-interest. We're, we're technologists, and, and uh, we will geek out on, on Spark and, and Hadoop and Kafka and the likes and, uh, with the best of them. but. Uh, we work for a living and we get hired by other companies to help them do something and it turns out unless you're doing something really valuable, nobody really cares about what you did with Hadoop, right? So um, you know, the enlightened self-interest of these data strategies is we want to position companies to do valuable things with these technologies and open up real val business value as opposed to academic prototypes. But it's interesting when you, when you talk about, you know, the conferences, are, it's almost like hijacked by guys who are you know, trudging along, solving day-to-day -day problems, yep. and you want to elevate the discussion, that's a different level in the organization. How do you reach the people who want to engage in, in that discussion? So it's interesting. There's, there's, um, there's both a top-down uh, way this works. Um, you know, the, the business press is imp increasingly talking about the, the real value of these things, right? And um, most, uh, most, most CEOs are at least aware of some of the stories of data around various industries. It's hard to miss Amazon, for instance, and what they've been able to do, or Google, for that matter, or Yahoo, or some of, the, some of the, those ilk. Uh, so we are speaking at least to a C-suite audience, typically, that is somewhat enlightened, if not uh, fully understand or, or, or made it from, hey, that looks interesting, to this is how that might work in my world or with my company. Um, so, so there is that increasing sea level business level awareness of what data can do that's outside of the IT departments, so to speak, creating some top-down uh, pressure and um, momentum for these kinds of uh, different views of, of data and how we're going to apply them to an organization. And then there's sort of enlightened folks within the organization who become change agents. So sometimes it's a bottom-up somebody in the IT department has thought, hey, there's a better way of doing this. Uh, my, my VP of engineering, it would, when he was at Yahoo and started hearing about what, the, what one group was doing with Hadoop, was, he was working in some paid search stuff, and he's like, hey, I can use that to do some of the stuff I'm currently doing in a different architecture to do that better, right? So you get these people uh, also from a bottom-up perspective who are seeing value opportunities and articulating it upwards. So in, in the best circumstance, you get a combination of those two uh, dynamics and, and, and a lot of will to move and innovate. You know, you're talking about your, your three prongs in sort of architecture, uh, data strategy, architecture, and, and build out. Um, how do those then kind of coalesce, you know, around the, the analytics platform then? So, you know, that's obviously there, there's, uh, there's, there's relationship there. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and um, it's, it's, it's been tempting and business has for many years been able to sort of relegate the kind of the database choices and the underlying data infrastructure to operations in IT, and it hasn't had a huge impact on business historically. And you know, I think um, one of the recognitions of I, I, sometimes I think of the, the the I guess the tens. We're in the tens. It's not the aughts anymore. It's the teens. Um, here in the teens, it's revenge of the nerds time. Uh, in that, actually, that platform can make or break a lot of business value. If you're building a SaaS product and you platform it on something that just that has a poor cost to serve characteristic, if you have a, have a database and, and um, we've done projects with companies who you know, start out and they implemented something on Oracle and then they were massively successful. And it turns out that if they'd continue to grow that, 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 that they'd give all their money to, to Oracle and actually end up with an economic product. Whereas if you put that on a modern scale out platform, you're able to preserve the cost to serve economics of it. Mm -hmm. So the platform isn't just a technology choice. It actually can massively impact the profitability of a SaaS product mm -hmm. or a service offering. And the other thing is that, that within that platform, you can make it easier or hard to innovate on data. And so when you think about 
uh, when, you, when you sort of strip away the stack diagrams and things like that and just think about what you're trying to do with data, you're trying to, you know, you typically have some business problem in mind. You're trying to discover some data that is relevant to that business mm -hmm. uh, problem. And then you want to acquire and ingest it into your architecture and you probably store it somewhere uh, to integrate it with the rest of your worldview to better answer that question. And then ultimately uh, take that analytical capability and serve it back out to the business in some way to impact a decision. Sort of, I just described at a very high level of what you can think of as a value chain of data. And a well-architected platform takes friction out of all of those stages. And a poorly architected platform is fraught with friction in all of those stages. And, and, and the same thing can be said on the process side. So do your processes make it easy to traverse that or do they make it hard uh, and, and <clears throat> as well? And so the platform is really a very important component to how companies are able to innovate. Uh, and, and we've worked with lots of large companies where they've got a very talented data science team, for instance, uh, that they are starting to put in place. But their ability to access data and do anything with it is, is sometimes non-existent. Um, sometimes incredibly, you know, it takes them literally three months of going door to door asking people to, to get more of it, uh, et cetera. So, so it really can have a phenomenal impact on, on what folks are able to do. Let me take the one part of that answer and unpack it when you're talking about like the value chain of data. Yep. Um, we know that, I love this quote that came from a VP of marketing at Lotus referring to legacy applications, um, meaning those are the ones that work. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> If you've, you've <laughs> yep. got this new value, you know, value chain of data yep. in, ingest, analyzed, operationalized, you don't want to throw the legacy stuff out. You want to augment it. Is there a set of, are there, are there certain ways of thinking about how you do that without breaking things? Yeah. So you're, you know, it's the... Um you're changing the, the engine's plane while the, the yes. plane's engine while the plane is still in the air. Yeah, all four of them. And, <laughs> yeah, and um, and there's both technical uh, approaches that make that easier, and then sort of a, a more strategic approach. So. Uh, whether it's engineering sort of a greenfield uh, architecture for someone, or I should say architecting a, a, a greenfield uh, approach for someone, or uh, working with somebody who's got a fairly developed uh, internal infrastructure already, um, abstracting at the right level in the right places to make it easier to change your mind later, to isolate concerns of components, um, and that kind of thing is really, really important to making an architecture extensible and, 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 uh, and really evolve with, with technology and capture the benefit of these new approaches. Within that, we typically use services approaches to implement that abstraction, which is to say, you know, that, that we, we have some legacy application, it's used to consuming some set of customer information. We build a service first that surfaces that customer information, and then we point the legacy application at that. Now, now it's talking to a service and we can go change the thing that is implementing that without disturbing that application. Meaning change the service. It change, yeah, change the data infrastructure that's providing it so that the applications that are consuming that are none the wiser. And that's not just for once, that's for all time. Now you've got a nice application that is intermediated by the service to the underlying infrastructure. And as you need to innovate and evolve that, you can without disrupting these consuming applications. So uh, microservices architectures are, are uh, the, the, the trend you're seeing of people reaching to this approach to accomplish that kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, Famously, Amazon's been tremendously successful at, at, you know, when you think about what they have to do to make uh, inventory across hundreds of thousands of retailers feel like a single pane of glass, the complexity that they are managing behind those services mm -hmm. is, is amazing, and they're able to do it because they, they use that services And approach. it sounds like that microservices approach would be appropriate not just for the legacy monolithic apps, but for the greenfield ones mm -hmm. too. Absolutely. Se se separation of concerns. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I've been fond of telling clients that um, basically anybody that comes in and says they've got their your future state figured out, I would throw out of my <laughs> office. Because, you know, if there's one thing I've learned in, in, in 
let's say 20 odd years of doing these kinds of, these kinds of projects and building things uh, with data, it's that whatever we think we understand about the world today, two years from now, there's going to be a bunch of options we can't anticipate that will change the way we'll think about things. And so we should be architecting and building for a state of constant change and innovation, not uh, some city on the hill that we exquisitely design and set out a, a multi-year roadmap to get to. Well, okay, that actually raises another pretty serious question, which is you have the legacy app, which itself is generally monolithic because mm -hmm. modularity was very difficult back yep. then. So um, how do you make that future-proof or, or as future-proof as your microservices Greenfield app might be? Well, you know, there, there's a bunch of services that are ultimately backed by old mainframe processes still, right? In other words, abstracting away and, and using a, a, a legacy uh, approach, a mainframe in some cases, uh, a, a, leg, you know, a legacy specialized industry specific application, you know, I don't know, to run mining equipment or something, right? And, and those things indeed work and, and um, you, you don't replace them until you can improve them uh, or at least you know, lift and shift them uh, to modern architectures. And typically we're, we're leaving them in place and then forking them for other purposes, right? So on the inputs, you know, maybe uh, we'll, we'll do that same services trick and start feeding them both the inputs and feeding the outputs to services for the rest of the world, whereas their stove types pipe stays unchanged, at least as far as the consuming application. Oh, so you put essentially new interfaces Around it. exactly, okay. so the, we're basically it's it's forking the pipe of data, right? Okay. Both on the inside, fork off the inputs into uh, whatever your modern architecture is to do whatever the n plus one thing you want to do with it is, and then similarly, if if that application is providing valuable outputs back to the business, uh, fork the the responses too. So we'll do this like with um, with inventory systems in a supply chain or something like that. They're still getting the updates in the same way. We're just listening in on that same on that same uh, pipe, basically, of where those updates are coming from so that we can handle them uh, elsewhere. And on the same time, as it uh, sends out updates about inventory, we're listening to those as well. And so, actually, that's a great app example of a Spark application we actually built for a major retail to, retailer to manage real-time inventory over the holidays, right? So you're you're sort of taking the, the batch 15-minute interval legacy um, inventory application on the one hand, and you're listening to those updates in real time and keeping a real time delta over here in memory ah. alongside of it. Oh, you have uh, a shadow. So you're basically shadowing it. So now I'm still using my legacy in inventory system as intended, but I've got this real time service sitting next to it that allows me to do fundamentally different things on the holidays. And I think they credited that with like a, something on the order of a 20 to 30% lift in online sales for them. Uh, uh, that holiday. Around Black Friday, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, if I think, I think I read the, the case study on the website. Old dogs, new tricks yep. is what it sounds like. Good yeah, deal. Absolutely. John, thanks for being with us. We appreciate your sharing the information and your time. Hey, it's my pleasure. It's been you a good bet, time. John. Good to have you. Thank uh, you. The Cube continues from San Fran right after this.